Well, my wife and I, we like to do date night once a week. And just a few weeks ago, we went to Newtown for date night. And we went to one of the new trendy hip places. It's called Mary's. It's just a hamburger joint run by a chef. It's just a hole in the wall. There's no signage. But when you get there, there's a long line of people, university students, lining up, waiting to go in. And that night, there was a bouncer at the front, and he was just IDing everyone. Didn't matter how old or young you look, he was going to ID you. So my wife and I lined up, we had our IDs out, and when we got to the front of the line, he didn't ID us. <laughs> he just waved us in with a, oh, ouch. He, we were thinking, look how young and hip and trendy we are, but really, in reality, we were just old, conservative and boring. He didn't even need to ID us. And so in life, often we can be quite self-delusional. We think we're one thing, but we can be something completely different. Surveys of drivers will show that almost everyone says that they are an above average driver. But as we know, by definition, only half of us can be above average. The rest of us are below average. But we all think we're great drivers. So again, we can be quite self-delusional. Well, when it comes to ethics, what if we're just as self-delusional? What if we think we're good people doing the right thing when maybe we're not? So welcome again to this talk. As you've heard, my name is Sam. I've been married to my wife, Stephanie, for 19 years. We have three young boys, Toby, Cooper, and Jonty. I work one day a week as a doctor. Doctors aren't known for being very ethical. I'm also a theologian. We're not very well known for our aesthetic dress sense. And uh, so I'm the worst person to come and give ethics to, uh, to a company which is priding itself on aesthetics. But here we are, and we're looking at how to be ethical how to live the good life, how to make core values count, how not to be the next headline. How can I be ethical? This is Enron, as we know, in the 1990s, this was the poster child company worth billions of dollars, but then in 2001, it all came crashing down because they found out that this company had been lying about its assets, lying about its profits, and lying about its debt. And as a result, jobs were lost, investors lost money, and some people even went to jail. Only a few years ago, Barclays and many other UK banks were caught up in the LIBOR trade fixing scandal. And this had been going on for years and years. Only just this month, Wells Fargo, one of the big banks in the United States, they've just found out over 5,000 employees and managers have created millions of fake accounts in the names of customers. And so this has all just come crashing down for Wells Fargo just this week. So this happens at corporate level, at individual level. I have a friend, a family friend, who works for a bank in Sydney. Only a few years ago, it was found out he'd been skimming money on the side and he ended up going to jail. So what if we can be self-delusional at the level of a company and also at, as an individual? How can I not be the next headline? How can I make sure I do the right thing? How can I be ethical? Well, typically, when it comes to ethics, there are four theories of how to be ethical. So I'm going to show you the four theories. And I think the first th three theories are good, but the fourth one is the one that works the best. So let's go through the four different theories. The first theory is we need a code of ethics. What will make us do the right thing? We need a code of ethics. We need rules, regulations, and principles. And if we obey the rules, regulations, and principles, then we will be ethical. We'll be good people. And this happens at every level of life. In families, we have a code of ethics. Whoever didn't cook has to wash up. The driver gets to choose the music in the car. If you were the last to use the shower, you must squidgy. If you <laughs> use the last leaf of toilet paper, change the roll of toilet paper before you leave. At society, we have a code of ethics, no smoking, no littering, no drink driving. As a doctor, we have a professional code of ethics, and one thing they're very strict on now is we must not take presents or gifts from pharmaceutical sales reps. So they certainly can't pay for a holiday, they can't pay for a meal, they can't even give us a pen now. And we think, gosh, it's just a pen. But no, the professional code of ethics says there are rules, laws, and principles we must obey, and if we break these rules, we're doing the wrong thing. 
Now this form of ethics is called deontology. The famous guy behind this is Immanuel Kant, German Enlightenment philosopher. What makes us do the right thing? Rules, principles, and regulations. And we can apply this in business and corporate level. So we have a code of ethics. We must not forge signatures. We must declare interest. We must not bully our staff. Now, code of ethics are good up to a point, but they have limitations. So there are three limitations, I think, to using code of ethics alone to make us do the right thing. The first one is what I call the red traffic light problem. So let's say we're driving along in our car and we see a red traffic light. Who here would stop? Just out of interest, who here would stop? Show of hands. All right, so every hand went up. We would all stop at this red traffic light. Why would we stop? Now, we, probably the first answer that comes to our head would be, it's the law. The law tells me to stop. So here we're appealing to deontology, Immanuel Kant, Code of Ethics. What if I was to say now, it's two o'clock in the morning, no one's looking, there are no police, no red light cameras, you would get away with this. Who here would still stop at the red traffic light? Just out of interest? Wow, we would all still stop. Again, it's the law. It doesn't matter whether they get caught or not. It's the law. Okay, now let's say it's two o'clock in the morning, no one's around, no policeman, no policewoman, no red light cameras, but it's been red for 20 minutes. <laughs> Who here would go through the red light? Okay, we would all go through it. Wow. So at some stage we would all realise we would have to break the law. There are situational moments that would say, this is a moment where I actually have to break the law. So the problem with laws is they don't cover each and every circumstance. So sometimes it's unclear when to follow the law, when the wise thing would be to break the law. The next problem is what I call the toilet roll problem. <laughs> See, if we have the rule that, okay, if you're the one to use up the last leaf, you must change the rule. What happens to most families is you make sure you use a second last leaf <laughs> and just use, leave the one leaf still there and the next person has to change the toilet roll. So rules make us think, well, how little do I have to do? Rather than make us do the right thing, now we're trying to see how little I have to do to pass the law. And the final problem is what I call the iPad electronic devices problem. See, in my family and in most families, they have a rule in the family that for the children, iPads are for weekend time only. So during weekdays, no electronic devices. So we've applied the law and what's happened is Friday night when the weekend begins, our kids come home Bang! They're instantly on the iPad and they're on it, on it. They do not stop using the iPad all weekend. They're on the iPad, on the iPad. And if there's um, something like a family dinner or we're going to the zoo, they go, no, no, this is the weekend. We have to be on our iPads. And on Sunday night, our boys are crying because the weekend is over. And they say, we didn't get enough time on our iPads. So we had to have a, hey, time out, family sit down moment and say, okay, why do we have the rule iPads only on the weekends? It's actually to moderate our use of iPads. But this rule has had the opposite effect. It's made you binge as much as you can on iPads. So that's a problem with rules. Rather than make us ethical, they actually make us think, well, how much can I do before I break the rule? So we think of 0.05, do not drink, drive. Rather than make us think, I should not drink, drive. Now I think, oh, 0.05. So that's three drinks an hour. That means I could have two and three quarters. That will get me to 0.048 and I'll be all right. <laughs> so rather than think, hey, this should moderate my behavior. Now I think, how much can I do uh, before I get away with it? So let's say I got married. I make these vows with my wife. I will not cheat. I will not have an affair. Now we think, whoa, what counts as an affair? Well, you know, harmless flirting, texting, is that an affair? So now, rather than make us be ethical, rules make us think, how much can I do before I break the rules? So that's a problem if all we have is a code of ethics. So that brings us to, other people say, well, we need number two, consequences. That will make us do the right thing. Think before you act, what will the consequences be? So why do we have rules like no ball games in the house? consequences. We will break something. Why do we say you must stop at the red traffic light? Because if you go through it, consequences. We have an accident, that is a bad result, that is a bad action. Why, as a doctor, must I not take a pen 
from a pharmaceutical sales rep because now they own me with this pen and now I will over prescribe on medications that I should not prescribe in the first place. They are bad consequences. And when it comes to professional business ethics, we have to think of consequences. Why must I do the right thing to the customer? Because this will actually lead to good consequences. So I was just reading lately that a manager of a very prominent bank in Sydney says, with our point of difference, we'll be, we will be ethical and honest, and this will give us a competitive advantage over the other banks. Why must we do the right thing? Because it leads to good results. Why must we not do bad things? Because that will give us bad results. This form of ethics is called consequentialism. We can trace it back to John Stuart Mill, and his famous form of consequentialist ethics is called utilitarianism. The greatest good for the greatest number of people. What do we mean by good? Well, something that will maximize pleasure. What do we mean by bad? Something that causes harm or pain. Greatest good for the greatest number of people. But there's some problems with consequentialism. There are at least two problems. The first problem is this. It becomes an ends justifies the means ethics. So Lance Armstrong won seven Tour de France's. Now we've found out he cheated. That was bad, but bad only because he got caught. If he didn't get caught, it would have been okay. And the same with Wells Fargo. They've been doing this for years, creating fake accounts. Why was it bad? Because they got caught. Now it's bad for share market prices. But if they got away with it, it would have been okay. So that's the first problem of consequentialism. It leads to an ends justified for means sort of approach to ethics. But the second problem is this. When we say good results, good results for who? Who are we talking about? So, should we have dropped the atomic bomb in World War II on Japan? Well, it all depends who we're talking about. For the Allies, this was a good result. It ended the war, saved lots of Allied lives. But for the Japanese, this was a bad result. A lot of Japanese people died. So who are we talking about when we talk about results? In business, are we talking about results for the shareholder? Because often what is good for the shareholder is not good for the customer. And what's good for the customer is usually not what's good for the shareholder. Same issue when we come in sales or real estate. What is good for the seller is not good for the buyer. What is good for the buyer is not good for the seller. So when we talk about consequentialist ethics, we have to decide, well, who are we talking about when we talk about good results versus bad results? So this leads us to a third choice now, culture. We need to create an ethical culture where we'll always do the right thing. And culture exists at many levels of society. In sports, there are traditions and rituals which create a sporting culture. In family, we have traditions and rituals. Maybe once a week we must have a sit-down meal together, no electronic devices at the table. Maybe that's our family culture. In society, we have traditions and rituals like we must queue up to catch a bus. Maybe other societies don't have that same ritual and tradition. In medicine, there are rituals and traditions of sterility, hierarchy, and authority. And this form of ethics we can call social contract ethics. Thomas Hobbes is a famous name when it comes to social contract ethics, where we basically just sit down and we agree on what's ethical behavior, what's ethical culture. Now, the problem with only using culture is this. Culture changes. So what we think is uh, very fashionable in, in, in one decade suddenly becomes not very fashionable the next decade. Uh, this is not my photo I found off the internet, but I have a photo that looks very similar from year 10. And see, that would have been very in several decades ago, now very out. And the same with ethics. Like when I was a junior doctor 20, 30 years ago, it was okay to take gifts from pharmaceutical companies. It was okay to have them pay for your dinner. It was okay to have them pay for your holiday. Now, 20 years later, so, oh, that's not okay. That means what we think is right one decade can be seen as wrong the next decade. It's not very fixed what is right and wrong. The other problem we're using culture as our guide for ethics is this. Culture naturally drifts towards the lowest common denominator. So there's a famous experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment, 1971. They randomly assigned students into two groups. Some became prison guards, some became prisoners. And within only a few days, there was abuse, uh, torture, and, and, and bullying. 
and you think, wow, these, these are the elite students of the United States, and they descended to the lowest common denominator. So culture often drifts down rather than up when it comes to ethics. So that leads me now to the fourth choice when it comes to ethics. It's called character, and I think core values reflects very much a character approach to ethics. How does character work? Well, it's more who should I be rather than what should I do? Let me give you an example. I've just met William today. Let's say William and I decide to go on a shooting trip and we'll go shooting at these boom, clay targets and William gets the gun and he thinks he doesn't like Sam. He doesn't like me. This is my chance to kill Sam and get away with it. I will make it look like I was aiming at the target and he said, bang, I'm gonna shoot <laughs> Sam instead. So he shoots the gun, that's the action. The result is a dead me and his motive was to kill me. In a court of law, they would rule that murder. But let's say he doesn't want to kill me. He's trying to shoot the target, but because he's such a bad shot, he hits me instead and I die. Action, he shot a gun. Result, there's a dead me, but his motive was to shoot the target, not me. In a court of law, that would be manslaughter. Now, let's say he does want to kill me, but because he's such a bad shot, he just wings me and wounds me. Action, shot a gun, result, wounded me. Motive, to kill me. In a court of law, that would be attempted murder. So what we're seeing here, motive, character, heart, is the most important thing when it comes to determining the morality of an action. Same action, almost same result, but it's a difference between murder and manslaughter, a gift and a bribe, a wrong action, a right action. It's character that counts. And they say what we do, who we are in private, often exposes itself in public. Uh, who we are affects what we do. So they say, let's say you're in a dating situation, and you're trying to check out the, other, the guy, can I trust this person, is he reliable, is he of good character? Well, the best, most reliable way is to not look at the way they dress, because they can, they, can, they can put anything they want just for that one hour of the dinner. Not whether they can charm you, because of course he's going to be charming. He, he's YouTubed how to do that. The <laughs> way to work out what sort of person he is, is you look at how they treat the waiter staff, apparently. Because that exposes the real person. Who you are in private soon exposes what you are in public. And they say in parenting is the same. YouTube Children, will tell you to do that. <laughs> what was that? YouTube will tell you. YouTube will show you how to do that. <laughs> yeah, how to treat the way to start. And also in parenting, they say children don't look so much at just what you do or say. They actually do look at how you treat other people, especially waiter staff as well. So your character is very important in determining how you behave in public. And so what sort of character should I have? Well, there's a very good book by Tom Morris, If Aristotle Ran General Motors, and he argues for character ethics as well. And he says, well, there are four things that Aristotle said were virtues, which were core values, and which most core values reflect, and they are this. Uh, we want to have a truthful character. We want to have a good character. We want to do what's beautiful, and we want to do things that create harmony order and allow the flourishing of individuals and society. So let's go back to my marriage analogy. I am married to my wife. Should I have an affair? Should I text? Should I flirt on the side with someone else? Well, what I'm doing is not truthful. I'm actually lying to my wife. What I'm doing is not good. It's only bad. What I'm doing is not beautiful. It's very ugly. And what I'm doing is not creating harmony, it's actually creating disharmony and dysfunctionality. So this is a bad thing to do. So the character exposes what we do. Let's say I'm a doctor. Should I talk you into an operation you don't need, but I need to do to keep up my logbook? I need you know, 200 knee operations per year. Should I talk you into a knee operation you don't need? Well, what I'm doing right now is not truthful. What I'm doing here is not good. It's not beautiful. It's not what the profession is all about. And what I'm doing here is not creating harmony or order. It's creating a sort of a disharmony, a dysfunctionality. It's not how I should be treating you as a person. So when it comes to corporate and business ethics, it's, a, it's the same thing. These things are all interrelated. Are we being truthful in what we do? Are we being good? Is there beauty? Is there an aesthetic beauty in what we do? 
And this is creating harmony and order. It's allowing me to flourish, my client to flourish, my employees to flourish, my manager to flourish, and my corporation to flourish. Now at this stage we might be saying, aha, this is it. This is what ethics is all about, character, core values. But there's a problem with character and core values as well. And I call it the green bin, yellow bin problem. Once a week, I have to take out the garbage, but once a week, I have to work out, is it green bin night or is it yellow bin night? Is it green bin night? Is it yellow bin night? And I live in a cul-de-sac and everyone is thinking the same thing and everyone's too scared to put their bin out first. And there was one night that the guy across the street, he put out the green bin and we all went, ah, and we all put out our green bins and we were all wrong. It was a yellow bin night. And this is the problem, if we only have ourselves as a reference point, even we can't say what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, and what is harmonious. And then someone could even say, why are you choosing these values? It's just arbitrary. Uh, couldn't we imagine a world, a universe, where falsehood, badness, ugliness, and disharmony should be the values? Like, why did you pick them? If we only have each other as a reference point, who gets to choose the values? And that's where, if we have the Christian tradition, we say, well, there's a God who transcends us. We have a vertical reference point, because this is not just God, he's a good God. He's a loving God. He's a truthful God. He made this world with beauty and harmony, and we have him as a reference point. But more than that, in the Christian tradition, it says God didn't leave us blind and wondering. He left us his son, Jesus, as his reference point, because he sent Jesus into our world, and Jesus does three things that help us be ethical. First thing he does is he gives us an example to follow. Jesus is an example to follow. And this is from the Bible. In our relationships with each other, we should have the same attitude that Jesus had. He has, he's an example to follow. And then more than an example to follow, Jesus then gives us his own code of ethics, his own rules that we can obey. He's an example from the Bible, from Jesus do to others what you would want them to do to you. So he's an example to follow. He gives us principles that we can obey. But more than that, the Bible says he wasn't just a good teacher. He just was, wasn't just a good example. He actually was a son of God. He's alive. And if we believe in him, his spirit lives in us. And his spirit changes our character to be more and more like Jesus on the inside. And there's a verse in the Bible that talks about how the spirit from Jesus lives in us and this spirit produces the fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Core values, character. So our question today was this, how can I be ethical? How can I do the right thing? How can I apply core values to my life? How can I not be the next headline? And we've seen that there are four theories of ethics. One, code of ethics. Two, we look at consequences. Three, we create a culture that is ethical. And four, it's who to be of good character as well as what to do. And for character, I have argued we need these four things, truth, goodness, beauty, and harmony. And then I've argued that Jesus comes to be the example. He gives us the principles. And more than that, if we trust him and follow him and give our lives to him, his spirit lives in us to give us these things. I remember watching Batman, The Dark Knight Rises, and there's this pivotal moment where Batman and Catwoman have to decide, are they going to stay in Gotham City to defend it, or are they going to abandon Gotham City? And up until then, Gotham City had not been very nice to them, and Catwoman said to Batman, I'm out of here. I am not going to you know, protect Gotham City. And Batman said something to her, and it was this, you are better than that. It was an appeal to character. Virtue ethics from Batman. Be who you want to be and the actions will follow. You are better than that. And the more and more I read about books on parenting, they say the same thing. Rather than try to tell kids what to do, tell them who they are. You are loved by your parents. You are safe. You are secure. And that's why you're a good person. And because you're a good person, now go clean your room. But often they hear the reverse message, clean your room, or oh, they'll make you a good person, or oh, now I will love you. And that's not how ethics works. It works the other way around. You are loved, you are safe, that's why you're a good person, and that's why you clean your room. And the Bible says the same thing. We are loved by God, and because of that we are safe, 
and because of that we can be good people and because we're good people we can have good character and the right actions will follow. And so in the corporate business world just know that our identity, our security and our love come from God and now we can have a good character and then we know what to do because we have the example of Jesus, we have the principles of Jesus but more than that the spirit of Jesus lives in us and he makes us the people that we want to be.